We pray that you would move through this service. We pray that you would start meeting the needs of your people, Father God. Lord, for those that are struggling, Lord, those that have been going through it, Father God, those that need breakthrough, Lord, those that need hope, Lord Jesus, would you start to work? Father God, for those that are celebrating, Lord, just rooftop victories, Father God, I pray that, that uh, the angels in heaven would rejoice with them, Lord. Lord, hide me behind your cross, Lord, and speak boldly to your people. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, guys. My name is Manny, and I have the privilege and the honor of being the pastor here. And I have an even greater privilege of preaching the greatest news of all, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for our sins. And because he died for our sins, we are made new. We are made whole. We are made complete. I say it every Sunday, and I never get tired of saying it, but welcome to the church. Welcome to the church. And when I say church, it's, it's more than a building. When I say church, I'm talking about... God is counting on his church, his people, to make an impact in the world around us by how we decide to live out our faith every Monday through Sunday when we wake up and when we get out of bed. And I want to apologize that it looks like the 1986 movie Roadhouse in here right now. The fog machine is still going and the AC is not on. And so therefore, it looks like a place where you could probably shoot the fair ones on Friday night for a $7.99 entry fee. It doesn't normally look like this. So, so bear, bear with us. It's a little cold this morning. AC wants to work when it wants to work. And so we've been in the middle of our sermon series called Exiles. where We have been focusing on what it looks like to be citizens of heaven. You see, to, to be a citizen of heaven, it, it makes you a foreigner right here in this world. And when we, when we give our lives to Jesus, our, our worldview then begins to change. You see, the, the sanctification process of us being molded and shaped and refined to look more like the creator of the universe, to look more like our Lord and Savior, to look more like Jesus, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a process. And so week one, we, we focused on what it looked like to be a foreigner, right? A, a citizen of heaven, what it looked like to be wandering. Last week, we, we looked at uh, what it looked like being a, a prodigal, being away from home spiritually. And so this week, we're, we're going to look at the topic specifically of being exiles, you see, exiles were, were casted out of their homes. They, they wander because they, they can't return home in most cases. You see, to, 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 be, to become more than an exile here on earth, we need to accept our mission, our mission as believers to do what? To make an impact on the world while we are living in it for the kingdom of heaven. You see, we, we typically will see an, an interesting dynamic in biblical exile ideology. You see, to, to be exiled usually carries a, a negative connotation. But if you spend time diving into God's word and you spend time in the Bible, what you'll find is that many exiles in the Bible actually serve a higher purpose. Think of Moses, for example, a man who was displaced from home, because there was a threat of death. And what did he do? He, he found his calling in a, in a foreign land. If you think of Daniel, who was also in exile. And what happened with Daniel? He, he found an incredible blessing and success in the land of his captors. You see, a, a very common thread between the exiles in the Bible is that they are not thrown out by their own people. Most of the time, they, they were pushed out or, or pushed away by those who were trying to purposely cause them harm. And if you think about it, it's not very different from mankind. You see, we were, we were in a land or a garden created by God, right? And if you spend time reading through the description of Eden, it's like, bro, how do you book me a flight there? You know, and so we were in this land created by God. We struggle with sin because of the fall. And then we are then exiled out of that land, out of that garden. 
which I know for a lot of us, and I remember as a kid thinking, man, when, when I get to heaven, someone needs to have words and potentially throw hands with Eve. I mean, seriously, I was not meant to work. That's on her. And then you were not meant to go through labor pains. You should be ready to fight. You get up into heaven. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for the trumpets, the angels. Point me to Eve's house. We need to talk, right? Because she, she fell for the old apple trick. But if we keep it all the way real and we're being honest, we ain't no different, man. I mean, for a lot of us, maybe we're not into fruit, right? I get it. But I seen some of y'all on that drop-off line in the morning at school. There's a good chance some of y'all would trade in that garden for a good cup of coffee. Monday mornings. You know, and so even though mankind is now no longer allowed in the garden... It doesn't mean that we are casted out from our true home, eternity, with the creator of the universe. And so as believers, we find ourselves here on earth in a foreign land, but it's not our forever home. You see, the reality is that we as believers have a limited amount of time here on earth and that limited amount of time should be spent making kingdom impact before moving into our forever home in eternity. Today we'll be in 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, being a, a citizen of heaven should bring about a motivation for living godly. We weren't purchased by money. God didn't throw down any Bitcoin or gold or silver. The Lord didn't put you on layaway. He didn't split payment between cash and Venmo for you. No, our redemption was paid by the precious blood of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And because that price was so steep, we should live with that in mind every single day when we wake up and when we get out of bed as we navigate through this world as exiles and foreigners. See, the reality is that there's nothing that we can take credit for in that transaction. Why? Because it's not by works but by the amazing gift of grace which was given on our behalf. So we as a church and we as Christians, we need to understand that, that the mission that has been entrusted to us, and we're supposed to do something with it with the time that we have left here. So we don't set out to be on mission in order to deserve his grace. No, that's not how it works. You see, we first receive his grace, and after we receive his grace, it then gives us the passion to go out and live your life on mission. You see, once you've experienced God in your life, you can't be the same. You can try. Once you've experienced his grace, you will never be the same. Once you've truly experienced his grace, understanding that mercy is one thing, but grace is so much more, it leaves an imprint on your life that will never let you be the same. You'll, you'll fully understand. Can't nobody tell you that God doesn't exist? You've experienced him. You know him. You've seen him in your life. And guess what? It's a struggle for you to remain silent. You can't keep it in. Jesus just spilling out out of you. Walking through Walmart. And I don't mean bless their heart. That is not of God. 
you ain't got to lie. Because right after that comes the gossip. Oh, bless their heart. He's wearing pajamas again. Why are you judging? Just go buy your fruit and go home. The precious blood of Jesus. There's nothing we can take credit for. Nothing we can take credit for. See, we don't, we don't set out to be on mission in order to deserve his grace. His grace is what gives us the ammunition to be on mission. You see, I don't preach the gospel so that the Lord would count my hours in the field. I don't preach the gospel so that he could forgive me for my sins. I don't preach the gospel so that he could rain down blessings from heaven. I preach the gospel because I've experienced his life changing grace already. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it. In my own life, I've experienced it. And I want to share now that good news that changed my life with the rest of the world. I don't want to hoard it. I don't want to keep it for myself, man. I want to share it with everyone. And guess what? You're called to do the same. And you don't need a pulpit to do it. You don't need a microphone to do it. You don't need a set time on a Sunday to do it, but the Lord is calling you to do it every single day, every day, every day. See, I want to change my community for Christ. I want to change my school district for Christ. I want to change my job for Christ. I, I want to see people saved, man. See, I, I, I didn't get into ministering the gospel so that I could get my Christian letterman jacket. You know what I mean? Like, we, some of us still stuck in that high school mentality. Go get me that patch, put it here. Get me that one, put it here. And, and, when, and we live even our Christian life trying to earn stuff. The reality is that I... I cry out and I praise my God. Why? Because I ain't letting the rocks do it. Because I've seen him work in my life in such a way that I won't remain silent. I must speak up. I must give him praises. I must show him my adoration. I'm, I must share this amazing work of grace that he has done in my life. And my question to you this morning, church, is how about you? How about you? How's your week been in sharing the greatest news of all? How's your month been in sharing the greatest news of all? Regardless of your circumstances, I know stuff ain't right. I know you've had a rough time. I know things ain't working. I, I know things aren't clicking. I know there's frustration. I know your employer. I know your husband. I, I mean, I get it. I get it. I get it. That shouldn't stop you from sharing the greatest news of all. Man, it reminds me of, a, of a, one of my favorite Christian artists, uh, KB, and, and the lyrics for his song. And it's so awesome, man. I, I'm going to tell you, the things that you play around your children and your grandchildren, they're important. And the things that you allow to be played by your children and your grandchildren, they're important. It's awesome, man. We, we, we play worship on the way here, not just on Sundays, every day. And I got a six-year-old in the back that is emphatically singing along. Yes, he only gets three out of every seven words right, but God knows his heart. My man be going in. And ever since he was two, his favorite Christian hip-hop artist is KB. He even wanted a pair of Jordan OG1s, and he doesn't refer to them as Jordans. He calls them KB Shoes. And so he, he gets excited when, and, and what excites my heart is to hear him rapping along or singing along with words that are praising the creator of the universe. Man, you know what you grew up singing. He wasn't praising the lart, that's for sure. And so in that song, he said, it's pretty awesome. He said, never did change me, though they didn't play me, but never did play me. Leave how I came. All the dogs and leaders are called. I need a Dion. Ain't bringing no Drakes. The time is on prime. The Christ Amazon. 
Anyone from the clique can deliver today, keeping it grace. The people of God get caught in the fray. I don't care about no views. I don't care about no plays. Oh, you went viral. Where are the disciples you made? You can love Jesus for social media, but look at your DMs, then you put him away. Build your little kingdom. You call it the kingdom. You worship the algorithm, not the faith. From lovers of change to lovers of fame, celebrities, not the anointing, okay? And you may look at that and be like, what? When you grew up like I grew up, you go back and you rewind that deal and you listen to it again. You rewind that deal and you listen to it again and then you play it for your wife and she's like, I'm like, no. oh. I was like, I got to talk to someone who understands bars. We need to dive in. I'm such a music geek, man. My wife is just like, just play the song. The kids are screaming, move on. But it's so true. I mean, we got Christian on our bumper stickers. We got Christian on our social media. We got Christian on our T-shirts. We got Christian on our full sleeve. The problem is that the world around us can't identify the Christ and the Christian. Lord, would you soften our hearts? Soften our hearts in order for us to be moved by compassion in the action and to get off the sidelines of faith, man. I'm sure God is up there like a coach, like, yo, you ready? You've been practicing. I see you put the reps in. Get in the game. And we're like, the temperature's not ideal, Lord. You see the cleats I put on. Just don't work in this turf. And God's like, get. fine, Manny, you go. You know what I mean? So God is still going to complete his work, but guess what? He wants you to be a part of it. Because the blessing is not just for his kingdom. The blessing is for you. The blessing is for you. Being in exile doesn't mean we let the world burn around us. You know how some of us are. This ain't my home. This ain't my home. On the contrary, we should be looking to save as many people as possible. I always use the historical fact of what happened after the Titanic went down. Besides, you know, Rose. I'll never let you go, Jack. Never let you go. And what does she do? There's Jack. I mean, Leo freezing. There's room for four people on the side of that bed. Why is he in the water, Rose? You know? And she's just like, oh, oops. We all know why. She had that big old blue medallion in her pocket, about to live it up. Oops. Grimy, bro. It's not someone that's wifey status. You should have figured that out immediately. But when you think about what happened that day historically, there were smaller boats all around that entire cruiser. And it had the capacity to save hundreds. Hundreds of people could have been saved. Potentially even thousands of people could be saved. But what did they do? Those boats were only filled to about 30% capacity by the rich and by the elite, while the rest of the people around them died. Men, women, children, families. And I remember thinking like, you have room. You have room. Why are you not, why are you not saving them? Why are you not helping them? Why are you not bringing them on? And for those of us that really think things through, we're like, whoa, well, if you save one, then you gotta save them all. Do you? Well, if we we get too close to all the people, then more people are gonna wanna be saved. And so then we're all at risk of falling out. Really? Are we any different in 2024? Are we any different? 
I'm going to tell you, church, that if you walk around this city and you walk around this state and you walk around this world as a Christian with your head down while the rest of the world around you is dying, then we're no different. We got our little holy huddles filled to 30% capacity. And we're good. We're good. Don't mess up my flow like we're, we're good. The reality is if I got my heart set on home, if I got my heart set on home, I got to use my hands and my feet and my eyes and my words to get as many people as possible headed there too. If we're being completely honest around this room, some of us got family members living in the same home that need this Jesus that we're talking about, and yet we remain silent. Church, it's time to wake up. And let me clarify, when I say wake up, I'm not telling you to be that dude on the side of a road, holding up a sign, sending people to hell. I mean, you actually roll your sleeves up and start investing in people. Get in the game, start building relationships, start looking for people that you could disciple. Because as you disciple, it leads to freedom. And not just for that person, but you have now the opportunity to impact somebody's life so that it impacts their children and their children and their children's children and their children's children so that you can start ending generational curses by you just simply committing to connect with one person. One person. 1 Peter 1.20. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. Man, you think about Daniel. He was one of the greatest examples of being an exile who who managed to have a, a powerful impact around all of his surroundings. He could have thrown his hands up and been like, nah, man, this ain't my home. Yeah, y'all gonna figure this out. I ain't doing nothing. It's not in my job description. You ever work with any of those? Some of y'all might be some of those. It's not in my job description. On your way to your nice office, you walk past three Snickers wrappers in the parking lot, you could take ownership and pick it up, but no, we'll let Manny do it. And you keep on moving through. Could have thrown his hands up and been like, I'm not doing it, Lord. I'm in exile. I shouldn't be here anyway. This isn't my home. Let someone else step up and do it. You see, the thing with Daniel is he served through the rule of three kings, of two kingdoms. He was held in high regard in a place that was basically godless for his wisdom. You see, wherever he was planted, he worked as unto the father. And when he did that, the people who even employed him, who weren't believers, were blessed by it. You ever experienced that in your life? I remember I worked for Great Southern Wood Preserving. We... We sold treated lumber, and I remember, like, we went from, like, ashy to classy. We went from, like, lumber sales were terrible, and then they were through the roof. And I remember all the people were like, how did y'all do it? How did you do it? How did you do it? Man, you guys really got out there. And I remember thinking to myself and calling some of my coworkers, like Preston Warren, and going, they don't get it, do they? But they don't. It just so happens that our regional rep in Houston loved Jesus. Just so happened that our regional rep in East Texas loved Jesus. It just so happened that our regional rep in Austin and San Antonio loved Jesus. 
You mean to tell me that because they love Jesus that God is blessing this company that maybe isn't even Christian? Why? Because all of those employees realized that none of that glory had anything to do with us. And whenever anyone asks, how'd you do it? Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And is regardless of where you're working today, if you work as unto the Father, God will be praised by it. He will be praised by it. Wherever you are planted, God will be praised by it. And so for some of y'all that religiously eat at Chick-fil-A, you know you. I mean, you probably could have a helicopter pad at your house if you decided to give up some of that Chick-fil-A, Brady. But you got to wonder why, regardless of what Chick-fil-A you go to, the service is always stellar. You ever realize that? I mean, from Fort Worth to Dallas to wherever you go, regardless of where you go, the service is always stellar. And I know that we understand the mission and the vision of the owner. But one thing I didn't understand is when they opened up the one in Kilgore, I got an email from a general manager of Chick-fil-A corporate who said, hey, we're getting ready to open a store in your community and we wanted to offer up the opportunity for any high school or college students in your church who attend your youth or your college ministry or your young adults, if you have any of them that you think would be a great fit, send them our way. And in that email, I was like, bro, it makes sense. It's not just the Lord's chicken. I mean, they're hiring the Lord's people. Good luck at Chicken Express. <laughs> nah, I'm joking. Yeah, Chicken Express tenders go hard, bro. Dude. Yeah. You just don't get the same lovey feeling, though, right? Ma'am, I'm missing a biscuit. <sighs> You're breathing hard for it. I paid you money. I asked for a number three. Go get my biscuit. I'm not talking about me, I'm just probably one of y'all, you know. <laughs> but man, I'm telling you. And so I thought to myself, oh my goodness, like this is, this is such a great hiring best practice. And I thought, you know who could use some of this strategy and how they hire? TSA. I have yet to find a God-fearing TSA agent around the country. I have flown everywhere, not one. Matter of fact, I think on their resume, they're like, do you love Jesus? And if you respond yes, you ain't the one. You can keep on moving. Maybe you get a job at Subway, but not here, not here. Rude, man, rude. Church, we will make our impact on the world that is absolutely watching. They're watching. And how are we gonna make that impact? By how we love. The problem with the church is that how we love seems like a foreign concept, but how we love is actually our mandate. How we love, not by what we say, not by how much we know, I'm going to tell you something right now. You could read the Bible 175 times. If you do not put into practice what you read, then it's just a book. Just a book. It will know that we love by our actions. And so my question to you this morning, Christian, how are we doing at showing love? And my follow-up question to the Christian, and this is real, husbands, wives, don't be nudging the person next to you, but are we hard to love? Are we hard to love? Are we hard to love? And if so, why? Why? 
You ain't got to lie. God already knows. And your spouse does too. My question to you is why? You see, many times we all can answer that question with our eyes closed as Christians really quick. How are you at showing love, bro? I am the greatest at showing love. I'm passing with a 97 or a 98. I'm always showing love because I love the Lord. But the reality is that if we are really honest and we look in the mirror, we know that we are hard to love. We are. And if you know that you're hard to love, it probably means that you struggle showing God's love. Something is missing there. You see, why is it that some of us live out our lives as Christians as if we've only read the Old Testament? I mean... There's the Old Testament, and then you keep reading into the New Testament, and that is the entirety of the Bible. We act like the grace of God stops immediately after he saved us. You ever met anybody like that? Silence. That's right. Yeah. Like God's grace stopped immediately after he saved you. We forget all the grace that it took to save us from our mess. And it was messy. Don't lie. The Lord knows it was messy. It was messy. Messy. And guess what? It still takes a, a whole lot of grace daily to continue to continue to love you. Just because the moment you said, hey, 1989, I gave my life to the Lord, punched my ticket, I'm good. God's like, you haven't been good since 1989. And I'm still pouring out my grace on you. It's still a process. You will never get there. Find me the dude that says, oh, I made it. Did you? You done fell. Because you lying. And you struggle with humbleness. But the reality is, why, why do we live that way, man? We carry that in to every relationship. I mean, our mess may look different, right? Our mess, as we grow in sanctification, it may look different. So maybe we're not dabbling in what we used to dabble with. Maybe we're not struggling in what we used to struggle with. But you don't think that your judgment tendencies don't make you look more like a Pharisee than a Christian? I'm going to tell you right now, the, the, the church, the church struggles with love. The church struggles with compassion. The church is good at judging. Our four by fours in our own eyes, and yet we want to shoot slugs. The dude's struggling over there with a couple of two by fours, like my dude. I know this ain't the hallelujah message, but this is real, man. We struggle. Judgment tendencies. And, and I ask you to read the gospel and I ask you to think about how did Jesus deal with sinners? How did he deal with sinners? How did he deal with sinners? And then I ask you, how did, how did Jesus deal with the religious? How did he deal with the religious? And then I ask you, what was a bigger frustration in Jesus' ministry? Was it the sinner? Or was it the religious? And he came for all of them. And the problem is for a lot of us as Christians is that we all start off on fire. We all start off in grace. And then what happens is we keep diving in and we keep reading and we keep learning. We keep getting smart. We keep understanding all of these things. And then as we grow into that sanctification and as we grow into that relationship, our love meter just for some reason continues to drop. But that's why when they ask Jesus, all of these commandments, what are the most important? What did he say? It's simple for the Christian. What did he say? Love God. Love people. 
And for a lot of us, man, we bet in 500, right? Man, I love peace of God, bro. Man, I hate people. But I'm telling you something. There's freedom for you this morning. I don't care if you've been saved and sanctified for 50 years. There's freedom for you this morning. Freedom for you this morning. There is someone sitting in this room right now, right now. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to someone, and the Lord knows what you've been through. He knows what you've been through. He knows. The Lord knows what you went through in your childhood. He knows. The Lord knows what you went through in your teenage years. He knows. The Lord knows how you suffered. He knows. The Lord knows how you're suffering. He knows. The Lord knows about the abuse that you went through at the hands of the person who was supposed to love you most. He knows. He knows. He knows. And the Lord knows how you were affected by those who were supposed to love you that never even hugged you or held you, or told you that you mattered, or told you that you cared, or told you that they love you. He knows. The Lord knows about the countless times that you sat on your front porch hoping your dad would ever come home. Your God knows when you went to Little League games and saw your friends throwing around and having a catch with their dad, and you're standing there with your ball and your glove and no one to throw with. He knows, your God knows about the times when you have a daddy-daughter dance and you don't go. He knows when it's a day at school and grandparents are coming in to sit and eat with their grandkids and these kids around this cafeteria are sitting alone. He knows. He knows, he knows, and he understands why you're hard to love. He knows, and he wants you to know. He doesn't want you to be hard to love anymore. Anymore. He knows the dysfunction that you've lived with. He knows the dysfunction that you're still living in. He knows all the things that you still carry. He knows you're hanging on by his skinny thread. He knows, and he wants you to know this morning, you were loved. You're loved. You don't have to be hard to love anymore. Why? Because he loved you so much, he gave his only son to die for you just the way you are. But guess what? He doesn't want you to stay the way you are. A sacrifice on the cross was enough for you to take that calloused heart and let the Spirit of the Lord soften it so that you could receive his love And once you fully receive his love, then you could share his love. It's hard to share love when you fight with everything you have to never allow yourself to receive love. He knows. He knows why you close yourself off. He knows why you have a small select amount of friends. He knows why you refuse to let people in. He knows why you don't like to let people get close. He knows why you don't want anyone to to, to love you. He knows. And he wants you to know this day that you are worth loving. You are worthy of his love you're worthy he wants you to know that you are worth caring for he wants to rid you of that lie that you have been been believing your entire life first peter 1 23 for you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of god for all people are like grass And their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. 
but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. In our exile, in our time of waiting until we get called home to be in glory with our heavenly father, we now have a choice as a believer. We have a choice as a Christian. We can spend our time here blending in with the culture, trying to make it into the hall of fame of, of accumulating more things, things that you cannot take with you when God calls you home. Let's be clear. Or, or, or. We can stand up for more than our present circumstance. We can stand up for more than our present existence and we can push in for the opportunity to serve a greater purpose, a greater purpose, something something bigger than ourselves. Church, I'm going to tell you, if you don't know why you're here this morning, and if you don't know why you're here on earth, and if you don't have the answer to the questions of life, the Lord has it for you. God wants to use our story to connect with people. And in order for their story to be changed forever by connecting them to him. And so, although this might not be our home, I should care for the people all around me, not just in this building, but outside of this building, as if they were brothers and sisters who grew up in the same household. Let's let the world see that we are his by how we love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, that you would start to move in us right now, Father God. Lord, I pray for those that you, man, that you spoke to, Lord, for those that you're still speaking to, Father God. I pray that you would help them, Lord, that you would grant them freedom, Lord, that you would help them navigate, Father God. I pray that they would not let this message just end here, Lord, but continue to work on their hearts, Lord. Continue to help them in giving everything over to you. Father God, start healing hurts, Lord. Start healing brokenness, Father God. Start healing our people, Father God. Work your way around this room, Lord. Start filling those voids, Lord God, with more of you, more of your grace, more of your love, more of your mercy, Father God. Lord, for those of us that, Lord, we know we're hard to love, Father God, may you break down our calloused heart to receive your love like never before and that it would not be without effect, Father but that we could then love the way you intended, Lord, because we are worth your love. And Holy Spirit, for anyone that's sitting in this place, Lord, that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would pray this very simple prayer. Dear God, it's me, and I am a sinner, just like Manny, and just like everyone else sitting here today. But I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for me, to resurrect for me. And because of that great sacrifice, I am a new creation. Help me to chase after you all the days of my life. Help me to get into a discipleship relationship, to grow in my knowledge of your love. Use my life as a beacon of hope for the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.